Welcome to The Read Along, a mini book club for your ears, a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. I'm your host, Scott. I'm your other host, Anita. And join us on a journey through a good book, one one chapter chapter at a time. time. This episode of The Read Along is brought to you by Park Power, your friendly local utilities provider in Alberta, offering internet, electricity, and natural gas with low rates, awesome service, and profit sharing with local charities. In Alberta, you get to choose who to buy your internet, electricity, and natural gas from. If you choose Park Power, you're choosing a positive local business. Plus, Park Power shares its profits with local not for profits who are working to make a difference for their community. Shopping local is important to Park Power's owner, Chris Kozowski, and we love local at the Alberta Podcast Network, so it's a great fit. Learn more right now at Park power.ca Don't know if we need to disclose that we are now Park Power subscribers. So I'm doing it now, I guess, in the preamble. Uh, we were having some difficulties with our internet provider over the last few years. I don't know if we've discussed it previously on the podcast, but basically we had some contractors come in. They were hired by the condo complex because we're, we're part of a townhouse condo complex. And they were doing some work on the landscaping. And while they were doing that work in front of our house, they severed our internet connection. And we were without internet for several days. And then the the previous internet provider that we were subscribed to um, came and did a really quick and dirty patch-up job. Well, the first patch-up job went from the utility box through our front door. Yeah. Down our hallway to the modem. Yeah. Uh, it, it wasn't great. No. And it was like that for a while. Uh, Several weeks. Yeah. And then they finally sent someone to do a more permanent fix, which involved stringing a wire across our neighbor's house and down into a hole they drilled into our basement. <laughs> um, so at least it wasn't going through our front door anymore. But it still wasn't them fixing the underground wire, which had been severed. Yes. And they promised us that they were going to send basically like a dig crew to deal with it. And it took three years. Yes. Three years for them to do it, including one year where they had sent the contractors to assure us they were going to do it that year, and then they never came back. They gave us a six-month window in which someone would come to our house and fix our line, and then they didn't. And then the following year, they gave us that same pitch. Yeah, we it was... Did, and we were actually dubious that they were going to come and do it. <laughs> it was the exact same message... It was the exact same, almost the exact same piece of paper with the dates changed yeah. that we got. But someone did actually come and fix our line. Yeah, and we were very thankful and then immediately canceled our service. <laughs> uh, the only thing that was keeping us with our old internet provider was the fact that we were concerned if we canceled, they wouldn't fix it. Right, because we weren't their customers anymore. Yeah, so, so we held out that long and then basically immediately canceled with them. And because we have been advertising Park Power for some time uh, on the podcast and they are a local company, we decided to switch to them as our new utilities provider, basically. Yeah. So so now we, now we can uh, talk our talk and walk our walk because we are with Park Power. That's right. So a uh, little disclosure there. Uh, we are advertising for them, but we are a customer of them. Uh, we do not, to the best of my knowledge, get any sort of deal no. <laughs> out of that. So No, we're just sort of supporting our sponsors, I think. Yeah, that's there's kind no, of... I don't think there's no discount in it. Kind of the way that's us. going right now. But uh, some different underground problems cropping up for our heroes. Uh, <laughs> I see what you we, did there. As we move into our next chapter. But first, a brief recap of our previous chapter in which our team of mercenaries and our smarty pants professor uh, <laughs> find themselves amidst a grove of dryads who don't seem too very talkative, but they do get one ominous warning of danger. Ooh. And heeding it or not, they press onward into chapter seven of Questland by Carrie Vaughn. So Addie spends the first little bit of this chapter kind of thinking about how boring Lord of the Rings would have been to the people in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> like outside of the the snippets of action that we get, Tolkien kind of glosses over the weeks or even months of on-foot travel 
right? As these as this party like slowly traverses across the land. Yeah. Right? They're going a really, 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 really long way, especially on foot. Yeah. They're going a really long way by modern standards, right? Like we have airplanes and trains and cars yeah. to cross terrain and they had their feet and for a while horses and I think a pony. Yeah, the book <laughs> and the the movies kind of gloss over a lot of that travel, but if you really want to consider the scale, it's like they basically backpacked on foot across Europe. Yeah, more or less. Yeah, and yeah. that's not small. <laughs> no. And what I appreciate about how Carrie Vaughn specifically has put it is she acknowledges that they've been walking a really long time and that yeah. it's exhausting and they're sore and tired, but she doesn't dwell on it long enough that it's boring. And it's interesting because while Addie is comparing her journey with the mercenaries across the island to the team of the fellowship in Lord of the Rings. At the same time, she's like, I can only imagine how much worse it was for them because we're only, we're, we've been here a day. That's exactly what I wrote down in my notes. I'm like, <laughs> she's been at it for less than a day. And she's already like, I'm, my feet are sore. I had to pee behind a bush. Like, Yeah, she's like, I'm done. <laughs> there is no skill role also, for peeing behind a bush. She dwells quite a bit on how difficult it is to not pee on one's boots, which makes me think that the professor doth protest too much. <laughs> I think she peed on her boots. Oh, probably. And that's what she's dwelling on here. Yeah. <laughs> Like, look, it's really hard not to pee on your boots, so I just kind of peed on my boots a little. Yeah. No shame. <laughs> the uh, the mercenary team continues to trek onward and encounters yet another feature yeah. on the island. Once again, Addie is kind of interested in just pressing on to see what it is and gets held back while Torres takes a moment to scope out that there's no immediate obvious danger. <laughs> yeah. Something I love about this is that they keep finding stuff off the beaten trail. And off the map, for yeah. that matter, too. Well, to be fair, everything the is off. Map, everything is off their map because they know their map is out of date. But there's no road here. There's no trail here. It's just something in the middle of a forest. Yeah, and Addie kind of translates this as random encounters because this is an open world adventure. And while there is a scripted story that you can follow, it was even mentioned many chapters ago uh, when she was thinking back to the kind of the marketing that she'd seen for the island, that one of the options for visitors to the island would just be to go and explore the island. Yeah. Go do your own thing. Make your own adventure. So it tracks that there would be just random stuff to find. Yeah. I imagine it to be like an advanced level something. Yeah. Right? Like if you want the easy adventure, maybe you're a family with children and you want to go gaming. You stick to the roads. You encounter what you encounter. Great. Low level adventure. Fun for everyone. And then there's the advanced stuff where you have to solve a puzzle, figure out where this is in the middle of nowhere, and then get to it. Yeah. It, right? it's, it's like an open world adventure video game yeah. in that sense. And I think that's awesome. Now, Rucker at this point is like, how do? why do we keep encountering this stuff? Like, we're specifically trying to not find this stuff. We keep encountering stuff. <laughs> and Wendell is like, it's it's interesting because I certainly don't remember this on the map. And Almonte kind of wonders if this means that the design team was planning a mutiny for some time, because obviously a lot of work went into this. Addie Cox is also like, they were not telling Lang about a lot of this. And there's a charitable way to interpret that, which is that they were trying to impress Lang by putting in more. Yeah. Look at all this extra stuff we and, figured out. And surprising him with all of the stuff that, like, because at some point he's going to want to come and check it out, right? Yep. And they could have surprised him with all the stuff that they hadn't told him about. That's the charitable way to look at that. It's interesting that Almonte immediately leaps to, oh, this mutiny was long in the works. Yeah. So, I don't know. We don't know the truth yet. Because, again, we're encountering interesting stuff on the island, but we're still not seeing more of the puzzle of what's going on. No, it's true. I fall somewhere in the middle, I think, of those two options. Explain. <laughs> well, I don't know that they were necessarily planning a mutiny. But they were definitely withholding. Yeah, I agree. They were yeah. definitely withholding. And I wonder that once they cut off, they went, well, what else can we do? Yeah, maybe. Right? We'd already pointed out that it was weird that they'd included a feature of Lang in something that had been added later. Yeah. That was off the map. So I don't know. It's it's interesting. It's definitely interesting. Yeah. At this point, Addie is like, okay, there's obviously no danger. I'm going to go check it out. So she pushes past Torres and goes and looks at this archway 
with this uh, runic script on it. It's been made up to look ancient. Uh, Wendell trots over to go check it out as well, because, of course, he's the tech expert and his curiosity overwhelms his better judgment as well. <laughs> um, in fact, as we go through this chapter, it's becoming more and more clear that Wendell is a lot nerdier than he lets on. Yeah. By the time I got to the end of the chapter, I was like, his nerd is showing. He's been trying to keep it real, but his nerdiness is starting to override that. Yeah. Oh, his nerd is showing, yeah. for sure. Addy tries to kind of figure out what the runes are talking about and quickly pieces together that this is a shrine to Cthulhu. Yep. <laughs> um, and is amused because she says Dominic couldn't help himself but add a temple to elder gods. Of course. Because obviously he's a big Lovecraft fan. And when I got to that part, I smiled because I know what your face looks like when you got there. I know exactly what you looked like when you read that chapter. Probably the way Wendell looked like, which was <laughs> amused. Exactly. Uh, because he clearly knows what a Cthulhu is. Which is saying something. <laughs> I'm willing to bet that between Addie and Wendell and the rest of the party, Addie and Wendell are the only two who might know who what a might Cthulhu know, is. Might know who and or what a Cthulhu is. Yeah. Uh, the other benefit of this is that all of Lovecraft's works are in the public domain. Yep. So you can freely crib that for your fantasy island and not have to worry about paying royalties to anybody. How convenient. Indeed. Now, Addie quickly pieces together, okay, this is an encounter. This is an open world encounter. So there must be something going on here. There's some sort of puzzle. Maybe there's some sort of treasure. And Torres is like, we don't have time for this. Like, we have a mission. We need to get back to it. And this is the point where Addie kind of spells out something that we posited last chapter. Yes. Which is, hey, wait. We know there's something going on on this island. We know that they were putting together some kind of narrative or some kind of story. We don't know if there's a secret passcode we need to use to get into Tor Camelot. We don't know if there's a key. If we solve some of these puzzles, we might find answers to that. We might find something important that will get us into the control room. So give me a minute. I'll try to figure this out. We'll see what we encounter. And Torres doesn't really push her on this, which... Leads me to believe that he's kind of like, all right, we'll play it your way for a minute. We'll see where this yeah, goes. Let's see what happens. She did have the success with the Sphinx. Yeah. Right? Maybe it's worth another shot. Yeah. And I mean, fundamentally, this is one of the reasons she's on the island. Her logic is sound in this moment. So she and Wendell kind of pour over the runic script. And she realizes that some of the runes are not in the same style as the other ones. And quickly susses out, oh, they're buttons. I just need to figure out what order you need to push the buttons in. Yeah. So she tries a couple, like, she's brute forcing the puzzle at this point. Yeah, she, she is. She kind of tries a couple different possibilities and manages to hit upon the right one on, I, I want to say, her third try. Yeah, she does, I think, top to bottom, then bottom to top, and then alternating, starting at the top, yeah. bottom, and then working her way in, and that one works. Yeah, and she even thinks to herself, oh, it's it's escape room hard. Yeah. It's a puzzle that's meant to be challenging, but not difficult. Yeah, it's solvable, yeah. right? Because, again, you're you're making this for tourists. You want people to not be frustrated with the encounters. Well, but you do want them to be something that they can feel happy about having overcome. Yeah. This island, and specifically this particular puzzle, right, these two pillars, is built by gamers for gamers. Yeah. Right? So the logic, her logic is sound in that. It's Absolutely. Not, it's not built by evil cultists trying to keep people away from their secret treasure. No, it's built is... by gamers who are like, here, I, I concocted this cool puzzle for you to solve, and I'll be very excited when you do. After she solves the puzzle, there's like a click, and a secret compartment opens up underneath the uh, the shrine, revealing kind of like a secret treasure chest. Well, it's like a, it's like a, like a red velvet cavern yeah. with a gold ring in it. And she's like, sweet treasure, and snatches up the gold ring and is like, look, everyone, I found some treasure. And then the trap goes off. <laughs> Which I honestly should have seen coming. Yeah, Addie, <laughs> I really should have. And we've we've mentioned this before. She keeps just blundering excitedly into these encounters without really looking for any possible danger. And it's in this moment that it finally catches up with her. And she even literally says out loud, "Oh, I, I didn't look for traps. I forgot to check for traps." And the ground gives way, and the whole party is dropped into a pit. <laughs> So she's so excited to play the game that she forgot to play the game well. Yeah. <laughs> Always check for traps. And we even said, like several chapters ago, you'd think as an experienced gamer, uh, certainly an experienced role-playing gamer, she'd think to look for traps. 
right? To check out for danger before you press onward, but she keeps just blundering into things because she's too excited. <laughs> That's the problem. I have a question for you, though. Sure. Okay. So this feels to me like a weird mesh of pop cultures, and you are our resident Lovecraftian expert. Do we need to open up the Lovecraft box? Maybe. What is that ring? Oh. In all of Lovecraftian anything, in my limited knowledge, Lovecraft has never made a big deal about an object. Oh, there are definitely being... fantastical objects in Lovecraft's But anything being mythos. of that level of significance, right? Uh, it just seemed to me like a magic ring. Yeah, this doesn't feel like hunting the one ring. No. So I'm wondering what that ring means. Like, uh, is it is it a Lovecraftian some a reference that I don't get? Well, we didn't get a really good look at the ring, so I couldn't tell you specifically what kind of ring it is mm. at this time. I can tell you off the top of my head, I don't know of any particular mystical rings that are of Lovecraftian significance. Okay. That's not to say there aren't magic items that are of Lovecraftian significance. Just no rings jump to mind immediately. Mm. I'm just wondering, do we know what this ring is, if it actually is anything? Could be the one ring. Who knows? Seems like a weird place for one ring inside a shrine to Cthulhu. Mm, unless it was being left to find. Mm. I also wonder if it's as significant as I think it might be based on the cover art of the novel. Because there is a ring on the cover art. There's of a the giant novel. ring basically haloing a dragon <laughs> on the cover of the book. And I don't know if that's just a really cool design element, right? If they're just throwing a nod to Lord of the Rings. Or if it actually means something because they found a golden ring in the book. Guess we'll have to wait and see. I guess so. Yeah. I mean, the ring must be fairly important because it was hidden and there was a trap. So presumably it does something. We just don't know what. Yeah. I want to talk about Addie's logic for a minute. Okay. Because we've reached, we basically reached the end of the chapter now. They've fallen into a pit trap. End of chapter. We need to see how they get out next time. Mm -hmm. Right? There is a, I think, fundamental flaw to Addie's logic that I think is going to get them into a lot of trouble. I think Addie is treating this entire mission like a game as opposed to just the island being a game. They're trying to get to Tor Camelot because they know that's where the control room is. Or at least it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be, right? That's their that's the information they're <laughs> I'm working just on. Going to point out their information is flawed and things may have changed, but as far as they know that is where the control room is. Right. Now, so she's got this ring and it might mean something. It might help them solve a further puzzle later on. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to help them get into the control room. You can't find the keys to Disneyland inside Splash Mountain. That's not how a theme park works. No, but I think her logic here is less we can find an item that might get us into the control room. And more we can find an item that will let us access the place where the control room is. Tor Camelot is not just like a sealed fortress with all sorts of computers inside of it that are running everything. As I understand it, it's an attraction, which is where that central location is located. It's like in Jurassic Park, the visitor center has the control room in it, but it's also the visitor center. Yeah. It's an attraction. It's where you go and see stuff. There's a ride. Um, I know, <laughs> but I, it's just the way she's acting, the way she's behaving. She's like, we need to get here and do these things. Well, you don't necessarily have to do the things. If you can make it to the visitor center in Jurassic Park, you can get into the control room. But her, you know? she doesn't know if you might need something to get into the visitor center in this case. Tor Camelot might be a magic city that you need to know a passcode to get into, like the Emerald City. Maybe? Yeah, like there's no telling what obstacles the game might throw in the way that are preventing them from getting to the place where the game is being run. I suppose. She's got so a mercenary I... team with her that is trying to break into a room you don't necessarily have to play the game if you can find the room and and they're in like we've discussed this before torres's mentality is certainly we can just brute force our way into the room her argument is but if we play the game up to that point it might make it easier to get to the room we need to break into and then we don't need to break our way through <laughs> everything else on the way yes <laughs> that part is valid it's just i i'm worried that addy is taking the wrong approach to this mission, treating the whole thing as a game instead of just the island. And that's very, I mean, we've discussed that before. I certainly agree with you on that point. I think she's too caught up in the game 
and not enough in focusing on the mission. I, I definitely agree with you there. Yeah. It seems to me the whole thing is a game, and it's not. No. Again, <laughs> 10 people are dead. Yeah, exactly. There's some serious real life stakes at uh, at play here. Also, now that they've fallen into a trap, I think the odds of Torres letting her play more are going to go down. Yeah, because she just got them <laughs> caught in a trap. Yeah, exactly. He'll be like, no, no. <laughs> no more games. They're all trouble. It's It's all ended badly. Unless the trap is part of the encounter. Maybe. Like, I'm just going to point out that they may have fallen into some underground temple where there's further something to do. We don't know. The key to getting into the temple might have been picking up the ring and opening the door. Maybe. It certainly seems more like they've just gotten in trouble, though. It does. Yeah. <laughs> of so. course, who knows? There is a whole bunch of book in front of us. We'll see. And we'll see perhaps as soon as next week when you're going to read up on chapter eight. Yes. Uh, in the meantime, you know, a great way to end up getting hurt is to fall into a pit trap. <laughs> I mean, even a small fall can result in sprains or breaks or uh, dislocations. And if you're a small business, you might not have a huge benefits package to cover off your employees who are out in the field springing traps and falling <laughs> small or great distances. So you might want to look into something like Alberta Blue Cross, which offers great benefits packages that you can pass on to your workers. And Anita's going to tell you a little bit more about it. This episode of The Read Along is brought to you by Alberta Blue Cross. Alberta Blue Cross understands that running a small business is tough, and they understand that business owners in Alberta are busy. Let Alberta Blue Cross give you peace of mind with a group benefit plan. They offer health, dental, life, and disability coverage for you and your employees. Alberta Blue Cross group benefit plans are easy to manage anywhere, anytime, and on any device, making it easy for you and your employees to access. To learn more and explore your options, head to ab.bluecross.ca. Alberta Blue Cross. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> helping, helping people. And helping us out by supporting the podcast network. Uh, you can check out more about them and the other wonderful sponsors of the Alberta Podcast Network at albertapodcastnetwork.com. While you're there, you can check out other great podcasts. You'll probably find one or two more that you might like to check out. Download them on your podcatcher of choice. Hey, that's probably where you're downloading our pod. Oh, probably. Give us a little rating and a review. Oh, we'd like that very much. We'd also like to talk to you on social media. For sure. We are on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Goodreads. At the read along. Most of those, yep. Yep. Uh, you can also send us an email. Yes, we are the read along at gmail.com. And as always, we love you very much, and we'll see you next time. And remember to check for traps. Thank you for joining us on The Read Along with your hosts, Anita and Scott Bourgeois, a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network. All Read Along music is by Kevin McLeod and Incompetech.com. Cover art is by Aaron Beaver. Be sure to join us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Read Along, and check out our group on Goodreads.com.